Hey folks, today we're going to be covering Johan's replies to the Tinto Talk 6, which covered control, maritime presence, and a few other mechanics as well. If you're not sure what we're talking about, I did a video yesterday about it, which you can find on the channel. And as always, we're going to go over Johan's replies, seeing what he says. He gives a lot of context around the decisions made, and we also get some little nuggets of information, not directly related to the actual dev diary itself, which is always fun. And the first question we have here is from Radak. He asks, I imagine this increases the value of having subjects who will have their own capital to control areas from. This is related to the changes in control and proximity, where especially early game, it's going to be a lot harder to control the land that you have and get the maximum benefit from it. You're going to get less taxes, less manpower. You're going to have less control. And then the estates in that area are actually going to have more power than you in many areas early on in the game. And this question obviously related to that. And his reply was, especially in the early game where your proximity range is far smaller. So really, Johan just confirming that early in the game, you're going to want to have vassals rather than blobbing out as soon as you can. Obviously, you will be able to blob out a lot, but it's going to be a lot harder than it is in EU4 to blob out quickly and just gobble up a load of land. And, you know, overextension was a thing, but was it really? It is just a number as the meme goes. But in EU5, it looks like you're going to have a union of vassals at the beginning more than just blobbing land for yourself because you're not going to be able to control it, whereas vassals, you control those vassals and then their control in that area is like not affected really by the fact that you're their overlord or not that he said anyway. I wonder if it does lower it a little bit. The people that live there might think like, yeah, you're my lord, but really somebody else is your lord. Will they look slightly less at you? It'd be kind of cool if there was a mechanic like that. And the next one, RMS Oceanicas can control sort of behave like EU4's autonomy where you can consciously reduce your control in a location in exchange for less unrest. No, you can't. There is a different mechanic for that. So we're not going to get an exact replica of the autonomy system. As I've said in each of these videos, they are bringing concepts from EU4 and other Paradox games and improving on them in EU5. So you're not going to see these systems work one-on-one -on -one with how they worked in EU4. And Johan here confirming that is the case for autonomy. Stella CF then asked, how can proximity be made faster? Can roads and canals be built? Will tech affect it? And Johan's reply is roads can be built and there is tech that improves most of it as well, which again, makes sense as you progress through the ages. You're going to be able to see similar to history where nations got a little bit more like formal, I suppose you could think about it, got a bureaucracy. You really kind of saw nation building in this era. And Johan's saying here, yeah, roads can be built. That helps with proximity. And uh, roads are also going to be on the map, which they did show in the dev diary itself, the Sweden map that we saw actually had some lines on it and Johan did confirm they are the roads. So you can build roads on there. They're going to be on the map. It'd be cool if they were not like animated, but if you saw something happen with them every so often, make the map feel a little bit more alive. Maybe how like Victoria does some things like that, just to make it kind of stand out a little bit. And then Metz asked, can cities be reduced to towns or completely wiped out? Can cities be depopulated as in population moving to a more suitable or attractive location, and then Johan simply replying with, they can be depopulated, yes. I can imagine there's a couple of ways of doing this. If you're at war a lot, obviously your population is going to get drained, so that is going to pull people out of your cities. I would think as well, if you get sieged or something, that is going to affect it. Maybe if you're blockaded, obviously the population is going to whittle down if they're not fed, things like that is going to depopulate it. And then I'm sure there's plenty of other mechanics that affect it as well. We do know as well there is the Black Death coming, so you are going to see depopulated cities, I would imagine, depending on how hard that hits your realm and obviously all the realms around you as well. So cities and towns are going to be in a little bit of flux, especially earlier in the game as well, I would think. And then Amalric, he asked, very surprised sailors weren't removed. Then Johan's reply was, they work differently than in EU4. And as I've said with the previous ones, everything that's coming across by the looks of it is getting refined and changed. And I think things that don't really work sensibly in EU4 are going to get removed. And as we've seen, fleets are going to have a lot bigger say in your game. So I think sailors are going to be more than just, you need this many sailors to build this many ships and have them active. They are going to do different things as well. I wonder if you could, like, in an emergency, use them as, like, a backup army or something like that. Obviously, they would be absolutely terrible, but I wonder if you could do something crazy like that with them as well. But we will obviously find out way more about the kind of Navy side of the game in a future dev diary. And then Blackcat321, they ask, does the wealth that is not taxed because of the lack of control go to the estates? And yes, it will. As we saw in the dev diary with the control tooltip that was shown, I think it was like 58% control, which meant that's how much tax also went to your realm, 58%. The rest of that, we weren't really sure what happened to it. 
and it looks like it goes to the estates, which is cool because that's going to make them more powerful. So again, I think kind of uh, controlling the blobbing effect because if you can have a lot of land, maybe you can keep kind of uh, control of it even with low control. You know, if they're rebelling and you just use your army to put them down and things like that, which will affect the population, which again makes it worse. But before we go on too much of a tangent, it is also going to make your estates more powerful because they're going to get more money because you can't take a good enough cut of that land. And then they're basically benefiting from you having that land instead of you in most cases. So again, really cool to see them kind of stopping that mega blobbing early in Europa Universalis, especially with the time frame the game now starts in. Emil Gunder then asked, nice, now that we finally see some of the North with that Sweden screenshot that we got, will the Norse mythology still exist? And the answer is yes, there will be some tiny remnants left. I don't think it's going to be a crazy big thing. I think it's going to be more of like one of those paradox like Easter eggs where if you're playing in the north of Scandinavia, you're going to be able to somehow bring back the Norse gods and try go crazy with it. We all know even in the most recent paradox games, they've still had a little bit of that kind of fun in the background, you know, making the Roman Empire and things like that, where they do know people want to play and bring back these old realms and have some fun. And it looks like we are going to be able to do that. I'd be very surprised if they really like started on the map immediately, maybe like a tiny enclave somewhere, but I would imagine it's through an event or something you can bring them back. The next question was by Kingsley Dale. He asked, will colonial nations be present in the game? I imagine it would be very difficult to main control on locations on different continents. Again, linked how control and proximity works. They're obviously on the other side of the world. How will that work? How will your control affect them and things like that? And Johan replying with, yep, they are something you actively want to set up, even if you are not forced to. So again, giving you the choice, you can roll those dice, hope that you can control them through direct control by the crown. But you are probably going to want to set up like colonial America. And then I imagine that's going to work a little bit like they're being like a, a half vassal or something where they're not a separate vassal from you, but they do have a little bit more autonomy than if you control them directly. And then there's going to be trade-offs on that if you want to do that or not. And I think, as he says, in most cases, you probably will want to set up these colonial nations rather than having them under your direct control, which again is something you kind of see in EU4. But with the changes here, I think it's going to work a lot better in EU5. The next one, a little bit more controversial, I think, by Old Zealand. And he asks, can you travel down rivers or at least the big rivers like the Danube? And then Johan here with a bit of a surprise answer, I think, to some players. No, they are not. It's a bit hard to have a naval battle involving a few dozen ships. Now, I'm not sure exactly if this covers the question. Johan's talking about, like, can you have sea battles down the Danube and things like that? That's not really what Old Sealand, I think, was asking. I think it was more of a general, like, can you move transport ships down rivers and things like that, I would imagine. But um, I guess it still is covered by Johan's reply. But it does look like you can't travel down rivers with a fleet, so you can't, like, blockade inner ports. I'm not sure how that's going to work with some large cities that were on rivers that were quite big ports as well. I'm sure there's going to be some other mechanics that kind of get around this a little bit. I'm not too fussed about it, to be honest. It is nice that you can travel down some of the bigger rivers with your ships, but also it wouldn't really make sense if you could do big fleet battles there. So I guess it's kind of like one or the other. You could do fleet battles, but like really limit the line of combat. But again, that's kind of like a weird workaround. So I think this might work better. We'll see, obviously, once we get more information. In the next question, Dong Wook UK, he asked, on Pops and Estates, will all clergy, regardless of their actual religion, belong to the ulama. All clergy, Christians and Muslims act effectively as one block. And the answer was for Muslims, only Muslim clergy belong to the ulama. So we are going to get different mechanics for Muslims for the clergy estate. They are going to just be the Muslim faith people. But it does look like at the moment outside of that around the world, you will have like mixed religions acting as one block. It is going to be weird, I guess, especially once you get like the Protestant Reformation. How exactly is that going to work? I guess he doesn't want to spoil some things because I would imagine during that, you maybe get like a second religious estate and you'll have Catholics and Protestants and all the other different denominations of Christianity and other places where the same thing happened. I wonder if they do kind of like sub-split out or something like that. It would be weird if they're all just in one block, but it is cool that he's already called out that Muslims will have a different setup to everybody else. In the next question, Eclipse asked, I do hope these upgrades are not instant or at least not the start of it. Upgrading a town to a city should make it so the burgers start to flow there slowly over the course of a couple of years, your fruit production starts to slowly go down. So he doesn't want to just press a button and a city appears, you lose food, you instantly start making more money. And that obviously isn't how it worked in real life. And Johan replied with, it takes several years to upgrade a town to a city, and that's only so it can allow all the other things. So it looks like you can 
trigger the growth up to a city and then you are as the person asks going to see like a slow change over it isn't going to be instantly that you have a lot of burgers you have less peasants you have more nobility as they've already said is the change that you will see it looks like it is going to be like a slow process and it's going to gradually switch over to being a city and then you've also got a little bit more time to kind of counteract that elsewhere in your realm so a good confirmation of this this is how i thought it was going to work they have said already they want to get away from like one click does something they want to have it more like organic growth and things like that so good to see though that johan has confirmed that's how this is going to work the next user alvero nunez de Lara. i apologize if i butchered your name i cannot believe this game is still using such an archaic and abstract concept such as manpower when you have a beautiful population system please give it another thought Manpower should be the population, not some magical pool of men that regenerates with no consequences for the local population. And uh, a bit of a funny question, because they've already confirmed before this that the population system is tied into all these things, but I guess maybe this person hadn't seen or just didn't really kind of understand that. And Johan replying that manpower is 100% connected to population. I think it's going to be a percentage of and you can be able to edit that with like barracks and things like that, maybe edicts that you can choose which change the percentage. But I think it is going to be a percentage of men. If you do have these long total wars, you are going to see your army get decimated if you're not doing so well in it. But that is how I thought it was going to work. But confirmation again by Johan that that is going to be the case. And then our boy Old Sealand was back with another question. Some UI that has been shown is very nice, but it is kind of bland. They wanted to keep that EU4 flavor, you know, the very like regal and renaissance looking UI. And Johan here saying the whole UI is just placeholder, except for the illustrations. The illustrations looking fantastic already that we've seen, but the UI is just placeholder. Nothing that you see is how it's going to look in the game at the end of the day. And I think if you do follow game development, the UI is usually like the last thing to get super refined because obviously systems can change, the layout can change, things like that. So there's no point putting loads of effort into the UI early on because whole systems could be taken out or put in and then you're just going to have to rebuild it anyway. As always, if you play Crusader Kings 3, they do some fantastic UIs for that and different like themed ones depending on where you play and things. So I can't imagine it's going to look that boring. I will agree though with Old Sealand here. I don't want it to look like Victoria 3 UI. I think like most of us, I do want it to look like that EU4 kind of like regal renaissance looking UI. Maybe different in different places as well. That would be cool. And then Irishman845, he asked, will you still have forts? Johan's reply, just a simple yes. So we are going to have forts in EU5. As with many things, I think they will work differently than EU4. I don't think you're going to be able to like use them in such a way to like block the path of other armies like you can now. Maybe it will, but I would imagine they're going to refine that a little bit as with many of these systems and not have it so like gamified, I guess, where you're like, no, I need to put a fort here and over here and then they can't travel through my land. It's great. Whereas obviously, historically, that is kind of how they worked, but not really to the extent they did in EU4. So again, we'll see more about this in a Warfare Dev Diary in the future. Joe Marquez then asked, will the game have slaves represented in the population? Yes, it will. I think this was covered in a reply to last week's as well, where Johan said that slaves aren't part of the estate. They don't have any power, which obviously is correct historically, sadly. But again, he's just confirming here, yep, they will be represented in the population which makes sense. Again, they're not just like a, a magic kind of percentage that isn't in relation to anything else. Alvero Nunes de Laru is back with another question. Why do we need navies when it seems like maritime presence always ticks upwards? I'm patient. I would rather have money and take a couple of years to fill it up. I'd rather if it trended towards an equilibrium and you had to actively use navies to keep it up at 100%. And it's funny here, because Alvero kind of said, this is a genuine question. Do you give us like a straight answer? And Johan kind of didn't. I think he is giving us as much information as he can, but there are some things they don't want to talk about yet. But anyway, his reply was, navies help with making it tick up faster, making sure pirates are dealt with, and making sure you actually have a maritime presence during and after a war. They don't just want fleets raised for a war, and then as soon as the war's finished, you just kind of discard them until your next war that requires a fleet. They want them to be actually used during the time frame of the game. And as they mentioned in the dev diary, you can use them to increase your maritime presence and improve that. I kind of like what Alvaro is saying here, though. I think it would be cool if it was an equilibrium and then you kept the pendulum swung to one direction if you had a fleet. And then when they moved, it kind of gradually moved back rather than it just being like a bar that you fill up with your fleet being there to kind of push the number up higher and higher. I think the equilibrium idea is actually pretty cool. That is also how stability worked in Imperial Rome. It was like 50, 
which was the equilibrium. It always tried to return to 50, but you could push it higher or lower depending on what actions you took. I do quite like that. We'll see, obviously, how it works in the future. And then Gurtanen was back. His question was, will vassal loyalty and enemy aggressiveness be affected by control and proximity of your land to them? And the reply is just some yes. So again, Johan kind of given an answer, but not really, but uh, basically yes. But again, I think this kind of makes sense. If your vassals are loyal, if you have bigger control of your lands, they're probably less likely to attack you. If you have a very controlled, centralized realm and you are, you know, seen as like um, in absolute control of it, they're probably less likely to attack you because you are going to have better manpower, more money, all that good stuff. Whereas if you have disloyal vassals, you're not in control of like the outskirts of your realm. Other realms are probably going to see that and think, oh, I can steal that. Now, they haven't actually covered cores, and if they're in this game, I imagine they are going to be. But I would think if, like, you've taken somebody else's core, that would affect the control that you can have. And if they take it back, obviously, they would get better control than you, because it should kind of technically belong to them in a way. The next question, so, Johan, will colonization impact our old world countries negatively as well? It would be cool if people actually moved from our country to the colonies we make or even other countries make? And the answer is just yes. So we are going to see colonization work very much how it did in real life. You're going to have like America, and it's not just going to be the English going there. You're going to get Germans, Irish, French, Spanish, all these different people traveling to the colonies, and that's actually going to drain those countries of manpower. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. I think we are going to see the colonization part of the game play out a little bit differently. And if you have too many people traveling to your colonies, you're going to depopulate your realm. That's going to make it harder to raise armies. Maybe then you have to spend money on mercenaries and things. So I think it's going to be very dynamic, this system, once you get into the colonial era. Narexa then asked, will the bailiff houses that increase control take a building slot? These are the buildings that they talked about, how you can build them and they improve control in an area, as they kind of said there. And Johan's reply is simply that there are going to be no building slots. So you're not going to see those, you know, this province can have four buildings. This one can have six. How a lot of these building systems work in many Paradox games, to be honest, even in Crusader Kings, you can only have a certain amount of buildings in each area, depending on your technology and things like that. So I'm not sure exactly how this is going to work, because they have mentioned outside of the Bailiffs, there are many other buildings you can build. They were talking about that with control and maritime presence are affected by buildings along the coast and things like that. I'm not sure how they're going to limit it if there isn't building slots, because I would think there is some way to limit it. If it's not slots, there must be some other mechanic to prevent you just spamming out a bunch of them. Maybe they're affected by a control modifier or something like that. It'd be interesting to see exactly how they do change it to get rid of building slots. I think that is a cool change, though. I think a lot of people will be happy, obviously, depending on what does replace that system. And then the very last question here is Metz asked, will very low control result in secession if there is a tag in that area? It could be rather likely yes, was Johan's reply. I mean, that's uh, sitting on the fence if I've ever seen it, but I wouldn't be very surprised if that was the case. If you have very low control, Say you own all the United Kingdom as England. If for some reason you lost control on all the areas of Ireland or Scotland, I would think there would be some mechanic where they can rise up in rebellion and then they could secede from that union and leave and kind of do their own thing. Kind of like an organized rebellion basically against you and split off and try to do their own thing if they win. And I think it just makes sense. There's a lot of cool areas where that would work. And I would imagine that's how like the American War of Independence and mechanics like that are going to work. You know, if you don't have enough control over the colonies, they can ultimately rebel against you and do their own thing. But anyway, that is all the questions I picked out from this week's Tinto Talks. So as I've said recently, I'm going to cover the Tinto Talks on a Wednesday. And then on a Thursday or Friday, I go through the best questions and answers that Johan's given. And I do these separate standalone videos. People have been enjoying them. I know this one has been a little bit longer than the previous ones, but there were a lot of good questions and answers. So I kind of enjoyed going through them, giving you the information here. And then we could all talk about it in the comments down below. I've been enjoying that every week. So I'm going to keep this series going until, uh, you know, you guys get bored of it, I guess, and people don't watch. But uh, anyway, we'll leave it there. Hit that like button, subscribe if you are new here. I'm covering EU5 up to announcement and launch and beyond. I cover Crusader Kings and I play other historical strategy games as well. But on that note, I'll see you in the next one.